What I want to talk about tonight is basically this observatory, but I will start with short introduction, motivation for why do we want to build it. It would help me if I knew how many of you actually study astronomy or physics. Can you raise your hand if you are in the field? Excellent, excellent. All right. So, first nomenclature: this big building that you saw, that's observatory, and that's called Vera Rubin Observatory. We already know what we will do for the first 10 years of that observatory, and that is a project that we call the Legacy Survey of Space and Time. And I'll explain what kind of data set we want to get. But LSST is a data set. And Rubin Observatory is the institution, the building, the facility. So I'll just go quickly through the first part to justify why do we want to spend billion dollars on that observatory? Why did community in the United States agreed that that was priority for astronomy for the whole decade? And then I'll show you some. Images of the observatory show you construction status, few entertaining videos, some instrumentation. Hopefully, you won't fall asleep by the time we are done. So there are two big questions today in modern astronomy, and that comes from so-called decadal survey of astronomy in the United States. But thinking in Europe is commensurate with with that survey from the United States. There are two big questions today. Technology allows us to address the question: Is there life on other planets? 20 or 30 years ago, that would be science fiction. That would not be even considered to be serious science. 30 years ago, the only planets that we knew were the nine planets in our solar system. We lost one, meanwhile, <laughs> but we discovered 4,000 planets around other stars. So we know that planets form around other stars, and there is no physical reason why there would be no life anywhere else but on Earth. We think that there are other worlds out there, maybe not with as intelligent technological civilizations like ours. Maybe it's just bacteria. Three billion years ago on Earth there was life, but it was bacteria, not any advanced life form. We, today, with telescopes like James Webb Space Telescope, we can begin to probe those planets. We can look at their spectra, and if we are lucky, maybe we'll detect signature of molecules that are associated with life forms. That's super exciting question, but I'm not going to say anything more about it today, except I'll point out this propaganda image. We would all love to make pictures of other planets like this, but that's nowhere near. This is propaganda. What we can do is just to see barely tiny, tiny point of light next to its host star, and then with special instrumentation, we can block the light from the star and get the light from the planet to get spectrum, and then hope to detect signature of molecules that are interesting. The other big question today is to understand the expansion of the universe. We've known for over a century that the universe is expanding, and the plot in the top right—that's the discovery plot from the first paper where Edwin Hubble, after whom the Hubble Space Telescope is named, realized that the recession speed of a galaxy is proportional to its distance. Today, we would fail students for. Having such lousy data set and fitting a line, but he had good vision at that time to draw a straight line, and that's called Hubble law. And it doesn't mean that we are in the center of the universe. It means that the whole universe is expanding, similar to this analogy. This is supposed to be a loaf of bread, a loaf of bread that has raisins in it. And now that loaf of bread is growing with time in its size, and if you now take any pair of raisins, if you wait until the distance is twice as long, five goes to ten, ten to twenty, now the difference of the distance 
for this one is 10, for this one is 5. So the change of distance, the recession speed, is proportional to distance itself. So it doesn't mean that we are in the center. It just means that the whole universe is expanding. And we knew that for over a century. About 20 years ago, there was enough ob observational evidence from observing galaxies, supernovae, and other probes to conclude, surprisingly, that that expansion is accelerating. That was surprising because the only force that is relevant on those distances is gravity. And it's just me throwing this star up. It goes up, decelerates, slows down because of the force of gravity from the Earth. It stops, and it comes back. If I was a better baseball player, I could throw it very far out. It could go kilometer up. But then still, it would slow down because of its gravity and either come back. Or if I was so good to give it enough kinetic energy to overcome the potential energy of Earth, it could go to infinity, but it would still be slowing down because the only thing that acts is gravity. And the only way to make it accelerate is to put some engine, rocket engine, and then let it go, just like a real rocket. And we don't know what that rocket is in the universe, because we only know of gravity. And so if you write now equations that govern expansion of universe, you have to put a term in those equations that nobody knows what it is, but it does the job. We can explain every astronomical observation, after we, that, after we add this mysterious component called dark energy, and we know very, very little about it, basically one number. There is no physical explanation. The other possibility is that we made wrong assumption when we interpreted data, because everybody assumes theory of relativity, general theory of relativity that describes gravity is correct. If you assume it's correct, you are led to conclusion there is dark energy. But there is the other explanation, that maybe just theory of relativity is wrong. We don't understand gravity on astronomical scales, and we should modify it a little bit, and everything will work just fine. And indeed, there are hundreds of papers by physicists who show different ways of modifying GR, general theory of relativity, and it, you can explain the data without dark energy. And the problem is we don't know, we don't have data that is good enough to find out which of these two hypotheses is less likely. So we need more astronomical data. Either Einstein was wrong, or there is something super mysterious in the universe. And so this is an example of data set that we have today in the context of galaxies. That is from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, that was a revolutionary survey about 20 years ago. It made the first digital map of the universe. Imagine now you have a watermelon, and you cut it in half, and now you look at the cross-section. And seeds in watermelon are individual galaxies. Each dot in here is one galaxy, and we are in the center. And here it's black because there are no observations because we were looking only outside of Milky Way galaxy. And the main point here is that these dots, they are not randomly distributed. They are not like if you took a handful of sand and threw on this table. It would be kind of uniform. But there is very rich structure. You can see that red points are clumped more than blue. You can see these dark spots where there are no galaxies. When we statistically analyze this, we get information about both how the universe is expanding and how the structure grows in the universe. And those two together can allow us to distinguish which of those two hypotheses I mentioned is less likely. Today, this data is not good enough. What we want to have is this. So this black spot in the center, that's the same map as this one. In other words, we want to see galaxies to a distance limit about 10 times further than we can do with existing telescopes. And to do so, we need new facility. We cannot do it with existing facilities. We could, in theory, but it would take 1,000 years to do so. 
with this telescope, we will be able to do it in 10 years. So it is a large telescope, but not especially large. They are of the order 10 telescopes that are of similar size. But what none of the other telescopes have is very large field of view, which means how large chunk of the sky you can see in one image. That field of view is 100 times larger for this project, and that's why we can do the job 100 times faster. Instead of 1,000 years, it will take us 10 years. And now, as we obtain these observations, we could, in principle, get all the observations we need for a given point on the sky in one night. But instead, we will take it over 10 years in 1,000 chunks. And the reason is that then we can resolve the time variability of the night sky. There are things that move on the sky. There are things that change brightness on the sky. And by comparing image that we get tonight with all the previous images, we can find what changed on the sky. And so the idea is to subtract two images. So that's Blinker that, for example, Clyde Tombaugh used to, to discover Pluto. He had a little mechanical device that would flip mirror between two images. Today, we do it in computer. You take two images and you subtract pixel by pixel. <coughs> <coughs> and here, nothing changed. This is one image, second image. The difference is just sky noise. But if you subtract these two, you can see detection of this new object. It was image one minus image two, so it's black. If it was image two minus image one, then it would be white. So there is new object. That's alert. And the idea is now to measure this in real time in 60 seconds and put on the web stream that everyone in the world within 60 seconds of us taking image in Chile will be able to filter for interesting objects from their point of view. And then you can deploy other telescopes and go after objects of your interest. Indeed, there is a special kind of objects called tidal disruption events, and one of the leading places in the whole wild world is in Aydovcina and Vipava. Your professor Gombots is the world leader in this project where we want to go after new events like this one, then look over a few nights what is happening, <coughs> and develop software tools that will tell you, oh, it's not supernova, it looks like supernova, but actually it's a candidate for a tidal disruption event. And that's one of the most fascinating events in the universe where a star, big star like our sun, comes too close to black hole that has very strong gravity and completely destroys that star, and that star goes into the black hole, that material, or just scatters around. But this whole huge thing like our sun can be destroyed, and we can observe it in real time. Andrea can tell you more. That's how far I got. Because of time separation of observations, we can find objects that move, like asteroids. And the main driver for finding asteroids is science, science of the solar system. Today, there are fewer than a million asteroids known. In the first two to three years, we will discover six million more, and we'll keep observing them over 10 years. Another interesting thing in this context is the potential existence of dangerous asteroids. Sometimes asteroid orbits get perturbed by the gravity of Jupiter and Saturn, and instead of going forever between Mars and Jupiter, their orbits can be affected and they can go towards Earth. And some of them can cross Earth's orbit, and for some of them, this can happen at the same time and Earth is there. And then you get asteroid hitting Earth. And we know that happened in history. For example, this crater in Arizona, it's about two kilometers wide. It was 20 meter large asteroid that hit there about 50,000 years ago. And now there is this big hole. There are no pyramids there. There is no Statue of Liberty. I just added this for scale and Rubin Observatory. But we know that happens. We also know that there are about 100,000 asteroids larger than about 140 meters. That's the magic limit above which really, really bad things happen if it hits Earth. So 
typically such asteroid would hit ocean, that ocean would then have tsunami that would wipe all the coastal areas on Earth, and most people live nearby coastal areas. So that's kind of limit for, for a number of deaths per unit mass of asteroid. Below 100 meters, it's not so bad. It would be regional, like you could destroy Slovenia, but for example, United States would stay alive. Or the other way around. <laughs> Or the other way around. <laughs> you can actually predict, with typical orbits, you can predict the impact within 100 kilometers or so. There is a whole slew of politics, like if we change the orbit of the asteroids a little bit, you could then aim which country you want to hit. There is a whole thing called international space law that is trying to develop laws for how we would do it as humanity if we found asteroid on impact trajectory on Earth. So we plan, we hope to get data for all these 100,000 asteroids, measure their orbits very precisely, and then we can use equations of motion to propagate their motion into future, and that works for a few hundred years, maybe a thousand years into future, and we can predict whether there will be collision course for any of those. Hopefully, when we are done, we will say, we looked at 100,000 orbits, they are all safe, go home, drink wine, and be happy. Now, if we find some object that is on trajectory, then there are mitigation scenarios that depend on how far in future collision would happen, that depend on the size of the asteroid. So I won't go there, but you are welcome to ask questions later. And now there are hundreds of other reasons why we want this observatory that I, of course, cannot go through. We have something called 100 uh, science book with about 1,000 examples of different projects at the level of PhD thesis. So it will be a huge data set with huge science potential. But summarizing, I already told you about cosmology, I told you about asteroids, I told you about things like tidal disruption events and supernovae, and the last thing is we'll also have about 20 billion stars in the sample in our own galaxy, the Milky Way, and we can use them to study the structure of our Milky Way. How did it form? We know that our galaxy grew in history its own history by cannibalizing smaller nearby galaxies. They just merged together. But the details of that process are not fully understood. And so with this new data set, we will have another step forward in understanding of galaxy formation. So all of that will be done with a single data set. In other words, we are aiming for astronomical survey. It will not be classical astronomical telescope when you build it. You ask people, tell me, what do you want to do with this telescope? And you all send proposals to the observatory, and then there is a committee of astronomers who will read all the proposal and select maybe 10 or 20 percent best ones, most interesting ones, and these people will get to drive the telescope. With survey telescope, it's different. You define the algorithm for observing how you want to cover the sky, and then one data set serves all these different purposes. So there is no time allocation committee, but there is a piece of software that has cost-benefit function built into it, and that's how we observe. So LSST is in many ways successor to SDSS. We liked to call SDSS the first digital color map of the universe, of the night sky. In that same fashion, LSST will be the first digital color movie of the night sky because we will have thousand observations and then you can run them as a movie and it will take you 11 months to look at the entire data set if you put it in a form of a movie. And this is an example how the night sky looks when you have survey instrument that can cover the large chunk of the sky. This is smaller than the moon. The full moon is below. Just for scale, it's in PowerPoint, just for the scale. There are about 10,000 dots in the above image. It's a color image from SDSS. In 200 times larger area on the sky, on average, your eye would see just one star. So this is teeny tiny on the sky, and there are many thousands of objects. That's what survey is. You don't pinpoint a single object. You just look at the large number of everything that you see, and later you analyze and do science with it. 
So where do we stand with our observatory compared to other great observatories that are being built or are already built? So you can see James Webb Space Telescope that made a big splash when it was launched. Great success. And then there is Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope that you probably did not hear of if you are not an astronomer because it is not launched yet. They still need a few years. Both of these telescopes are successors to Hubble Space Telescope, and that's the most famous telescope. This one is successor by building bigger mirrors, larger mirrors. Hubble is 2.5 meters. So it will be faster. It will get the same picture as Hubble, but in much shorter time. The advantage of this telescope is not that it has the same mirror, but it has 100 times larger field of view. So it will take the same time to get a picture of the sky as Hubble, but that picture will be 100 times larger. And so instead of having just a teeny tiny fraction of the sky covered, now you can dream about covering the whole sky. If you take all the images that Hubble Space Telescope ever obtained, it's only maybe 10 or 20 times bigger than the full moon. It's nowhere near the whole sky. It's just a teeny tiny subsampling of the sky. And so in the same fashion, these ground-based telescopes, these three are trying to make mirrors as large as technologically possible, but they have tiny field of view. And this telescope, Rubin, is more like Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope. It says, instead of building much larger mirror, let's build a system that has a giant field of view, 100 times larger than any other existing large telescope. And so it is this product of both large mirror times the large field of view where Rubin Observatory is 100 times better than any other observatory in the world. And this colleague, Vera Rubin, she was one of the most instrumental astronomers in showing that there is something that we call dark matter in astronomy. She looked at motion of stars in galaxies and realized they're moving too fast compared to what you see in stars, the mass you see in stars. That means there is more mass, but we can't see it. That's why it's called dark matter. And she was the first one who convincingly showed that. And so the observatory was named in her, hon is in her honor a few years ago. So to summarize this first part, that's the trade secret of Rubin Observatory. This is our neighbor in Chile, a few hundred meters from us. It has roughly the same mirror as LSST. This blue area is the area of primary mirror. It's actually better than our mirror because this hole is smaller. We will see this is not a hole in a slide or two, but this effective area for collecting light is a bit smaller than even for Gemini South. However, this is where Rubin wins. This is tiny part of the sky, maybe half moon across, that Gemini can see on the sky. When we look at the sky, we have this giant field of view that can fit seven full moons across. That's why this observatory is special. It's like wide-angle camera. We can cover the entire sky 100 times faster than any other telescope. It will take us three days to cover the entire sky we can see from Chile. Any other telescope would take a full year to do so. And the reason we can do that is special optical construction where there are three mirrors. Though there is classical primary mirror, the outer annulus in here. The blue arrows are photons, light coming in, bouncing back up to this secondary mirror. Then going down to the inner portion, this is all one piece of glass, but it has different figure, different shape. And so this is tertiary mirror, and then it collects photons and sends them to three lenses, and the camera sits in here and makes pictures. So with these three bouncing, rather than two bouncing, you can have smaller angles of reflection, and you can maintain better image quality across the entire focal plane, and image quality is important. And the mirror itself was produced in Arizona in their Stuart Mirror Lab, it is spin casting. This is an oven, like for making pizza or bread. This is the wall that was put down, that can be put up. And you take pieces of glass. I'll show you a video in a second. I just want to explain what you will see. These pieces of glass are this big. And this entire volume 
is filled with those pieces of glass, and then you put lid, lid on the top of this oven, and then you heat this glass. At the same time, the oven is spinning. As you heat the glass, it melts eventually, becomes liquid. And you can experiment at home with water in a pot or in a glass. As you spin liquid, it will take parabolic shape on surface. And that's exactly what happens with hot liquid glass. The oven is spinning, and you get parabola on top, and that's exactly what you need for optics. And once you achieve this free surface, then you cool down that glass while oven is still spinning at the same speed. It about, took about five months to cool it down. You have to do it very, very slowly to avoid bubbles in glass. And when glass solidifies again, then you stop spinning, you open the lid, and you have nearly perfect mirror, this outer part. This inner part had to be polished further to get different optical curve, and of course, we removed the people too. That was a joke. So this whole process is summarized in this quick video clip. So this is beginning of the process of making this mirror. That mirror was a gift from Bill Gates and Charles Simoni, the guy who was the boss of the team that produced Microsoft Office programs that probably you all used at some point. They gave us $30 million to procure that mirror from University of Arizona lab. So this was the beginning of it. Now it's spinning. There is no sound. I thought we tried. Somehow we killed sound on my computer, but it's not coming out from the speaker. We'll see later. It's not super important. But did you see the phase transition? You did. Oh, OK. So this is solid glass. And at some point, it becomes liquid and transparent. And then it cools down for many months. All right. And then these two robotic hands polished further this inner part. You can see the edge between primary and tertiary mirror. It's all one piece of glass, but this is one parabola, and this one has a larger, uh, smaller radius of curvature. So it's more like a bowl shape. And so it took about six months of this. We didn't make six months long video, but it took six months to polish <laughs> the mirror to perfect shape. And this is the end result. So you can clearly see the boundary between primary and tertiary mirror. And this is just a hole. When we get dirt on mirror, every few months we clean it with carbon dioxide and then wash it, and then this goes out through this hole. So the basic idea of this project is to take now this telescope, this large field of view, and cover the whole sky in about three to four nights, and then do it again, and then do it again, and we do it for 10 years, and we'll have about 1,000 observations of the whole sky to very sensitive level. You can look at it as a movie, or you can add all of this data in computer to become even more sensitive and then get very faint galaxies, galaxies to 10 times further distance limit than we have today because of those cosmological puzzles that I started with. Once we are done, all these images together will be quite large. It will be 100 petabytes of data. 100,000 terabytes. And when we measure, when we find objects and measure them, we expect we will detect about 40 billion objects, about 20 billion stars, 20 billion galaxies. It's, it's going to be the first time that astronomers will have cataloged more objects than there are living people on Earth. We, we are still not there. So again, this is the idea. It's like putting tile in your bathroom. Imagine you need to change tile in your bathroom. If you buy small tile, it will take you a whole weekend to cover your bathroom. But now if you go with this modern tile, 60 by 120 centimeters, you go one, two, three, four, and in half an hour, you're done with tiling your bathroom. That's exactly the same idea. You have big tiles, big field of view. You go 1,000 times per night, and you cover almost the entire sky. 
I mentioned earlier there will be no time allocation committee. It will be computer program, if you will, you could call it as artificial intelligence. There is cost-benefit analysis. There is a cost of moving from one point to the other. And then there is cost due to bright moon, that black circle, that's the moon. This circle is how far away from the zenith we go. This cross is zenith. Each jump is one picture. This is all 10 square degree, each of these. We have six filters, so sometimes we change them. And the computer calculates, where do I need to go to get most effective observation? How long do I need to go? How much in time does that cost me? I don't want to go close to the moon because that's too bright of a background. And so then it jumps. Each, each of these jumps is 40 seconds long. So this is 1,000 times faster than in real time. In one night, we would get 1,000 observations. And that will be all scheduled automatically. Sometimes you look back at how much you cover. If you have white space, even though it may be further away from the nearby place, you go there because you're missing observations there. So this way, you run it for 10 years and get the data. And just to visualize how good this new data will be, this is an image from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, color image. It's about one-tenth of the full moon across, so it's a teeny tiny on the sky. And you can see some blue stars, you can see some red stars, there are some elliptical galaxies in here. This is, to astronomers, this is 20-second magnitude, this is SDSS. We already know how this will look like to LSST because we got image of the same part of the sky with Japanese Subaru telescope, which has similar mirror to us, but it has much smaller field of view. So it cannot cover the whole sky, but it was good enough to show us what we will see. This is not simulation. This is real data from the sky, color image of the sky. This is what you get when you go to 22nd magnitude. When you go 100 times fainter in sensitivity, you get all these new objects. See, in astronomy, the more sensitive you are, the deeper you go or the further in the history of the universe you go. So whenever I get tired of zooming and reading technical papers and talking with my colleagues and I'm just tired and I need more motivation, I go to these two slides, I take Mali Gorky Pelinkovac, and then I flip for about 10 minutes until I'm motivated again to go back to Zoom. So this is our team. We have about 250 people building the observatory. We also have about 2,000 scientists organized in science collaborations that are preparing tools for analyzing the data set that we will provide scientifically. We will correct for instrumental effects. We will find objects, measure their properties, put in a database, give web portal through which to access this data. But then the last step, asking scientific questions and turning it into science papers, that's left to these science collaborations to those 2,000 people, including the group in Aydovcina and Vipala. The telescope, the observatory, will be in Chile. These two lines symbolize fiber optic cables that are used to transfer data to the entry point in Florida, and then data center will be in California in Slack Lab. We'll also have another processing center in France and another in Britain. So as soon as we make, as soon as we take the data, data is shipped from the mountain to La Serena offices and computer center. That's a little town in Chile on the coast. That's one copy of the data. And then second copy is in California. Two more copies go to France and Britain. So we immediately have four copies, and these three data centers will process data together. This is zoom in, so that's La Serena. Coquimbo Port nearby, so you take an hour drive on public road towards town Vicuña, and then here there is gate with the guards, and this yellow area is rented by American and European astronomical observatories, and then you go another hour up the mountain, and our two neighbors are Gemini and Soar. 
It took about 10 years to, to build observatory with the building and everything, and so there will be 1.5 minute long little video clip that will summarize these 10 years. First, we had to level the hill. There are two hills, one for auxiliary telescope for calibration, and this is the main hill where the observatory started growing in 2015. Did I somehow pause it? This is suspicious. So a Chilean company built the building. A Spanish company built the metal parts of the telescope called Telescope Mount Assembly. And an Italian company built the dome. I don't know what's happening with music and image transfer, but you get an idea. And we were supposed to be done in 21, and then COVID came, and Italians and the Spaniards, nor Americans, nobody could come to Chile. They were very strict for a year. And so everything got delayed by more than two years because of nonlinear effects. You can see Gemini South in the back and solar telescope. And this was the moment when we put the top end assembly of the telescope. Sorry, this is how it looks today. And this is the telescope itself. It looks a bit unusual. It's short because it has to move very fast from one spot on the sky to another spot. It's about 300 tons. You can move it with your hand. But when you want to move it quickly from one side to the other, it takes a megawatt of power. And of course, we don't have power line that transfer, transfers megawatt of power to the summit. Instead, we have giant batteries that we call capacitors. They are really capacitors that are as big as this hole, several of them. We charge them during the day. And then when we want to move the telescope, that power comes from that stored charge. You move the telescope. And then as you slow down to the destination point, that power goes back into the charging of the capacitor. So it spends not a lot of power, but the peak power is one megawatt, and that's solved with this capacitor trick. This was in Spanish factory that constructed telescope. And once we measured these properties here, we accepted it. They disassembled it into about 10,000 pieces. They transferred to Summit in Chile, and then they reassembled it. And now it's the telescope itself without optics is basically done. A few months ago, we were all extremely, extremely, extremely happy to see it move in the observatory, controlled by software for the first time. This is real motion. That's 300 tons moving from one side of the sky to the other one in about 20, 25 seconds. And so the observing will be 40 seconds, staring at some place on the sky to get image. Then you move, typically in six, seven seconds, to another position, take another image, and do it 1,000 times per night, and do it for 10 years. And inside the telescope will be the camera. Now, the very large field of view is good for efficiency of observing, but it presents its own technical challenges. The problem is if you want to Nyquist sample, which means if you want to have pixels small enough to capture all the details that you can, you need to have a lot of pixels. And it's easy to calculate that you need about 3,000 megapixels in that camera. So there are 3,000 megapixels in the focal plane. These are filters. You can see it's very large. That's project manager of the camera, the former project manager, Nadine. She was exactly 1.65 meters, so she was happy that she's as big as the camera. And that's the real thing. That's just a couple of weeks ago when it was completed for the first time, all the pieces were put together. So it's a very sensitive instrument. That camera by itself is a like $150 million project, so you don't want to drop it. 
And the first entry into the camera is this lens. You may remember from kindergarten that the larger lens was Yerkes telescope, Yerkes observatory next to Chicago. There was 1.0 or 1.1 meter lens there. That was the largest lens in the world for about a century. And this now broke the record. That's 1.6 meter lens. That one is also in the Guinness Book of Records as the largest lens ever produced. And so this is focal plane. These are our postdocs putting rafts in and controlling them. So the tolerance is only a few microns between this piece and that piece. These nine CCDs together we call raft, and they are effectively standalone individual cameras. All the electronics amplifiers that you need to drive and read the CCDs are behind. So if one dies, you can take it out and put a replacement one. We'll have two replacements. It takes a whole day to, with robotic arm, a whole day to insert it into the focal plane. It's very, very, very tricky. But it's done. This is completed focal plane. It's working. This is the image, pupil image. There was no optics pupil image of one photograph of Vera Rubin when she was young. You can see a few dark spots like this one. So we need to have fast readout when you make image. We cannot wait, typically it would take 30 seconds to read the information out in normal camera. We take exposure of 30 seconds. We cannot waste 30 seconds on readout. So technical solution was to split CCD into 16 pieces, first into two, and then each of these is 16, eight more pieces. So there are 16 individual amplifiers on CCD, and therefore we can read it out in two seconds. So there are about 3,000 amplifiers in the camera, and it turned out three of them are dead. So this is example of dead amplifier, but 99.9% of amplifiers of the pixels are active and good. It is hard to imagine how much detail there is in that camera because it has 3,000 megapixels. Your eyes are not capable of resolving all this. So if you wanted to magnify this image, if you wanted to print it so that one pixel corresponds to the angular resolution of your eye, which is about one arc minute, you would need to have about 1,500 television screens, HDTV, put together to display it. And that sounds like crazy. Actually, 10 years ago, it sounded crazy. Just a few months ago, I was Googling to see who does have actually the largest screen of combined televisions in the world. Once I saw in Shanghai, they had 100. That was like almost 10 years ago. Today, there are about 700 of them together. So half of this size in Dubai for some commercials. So maybe in a few more years, actually, we go to Dubai and we look at LSSD images. So I'm getting towards the end. This is, again, another little clip that shows the motion of the shutter. It's a very big shutter. It takes one second to cross the field of view, and there are two blades so that the effective exposure time is the same. So I can play it again. So you can see two different colors. That's because we have two different types of CCDs. We, had, we were not sure that we would get requirements met by a single vendor. So we had two vendors in the beginning, one in Arizona and one is English company E2V. And they managed both to meet requirements. They designed CCDs that we need, but they could not guarantee they could produce sufficient number of CCDs, 200 in time for us to put them in. So we ended up taking 100, a little bit more than 100 from one company and the rest from the other company. But the differences between them are smaller than the differences in effective throughput when you go to different air masses, when atmosphere acts as a different absorber. So that's smaller than what we already need to calibrate, so it's not a big deal. And the last clip is about filters. So we have six filters, five of them fit in the camera. And so they can rotate. And then you have a robotic hand, which takes one of them and then puts it in the middle in front of the focal plane. This is an old animation. 
It was a company that does things for business and military. So that's how they imagine astronomers. They wear dark suits. <laughs> and so this is now a real thing. So that was the filter changer was produced by a relatively small team in France. I like it as an example because it shows you don't have to have giant team to do cutting edge technology. You can specialize in something. And for example, these guys in Paris, they designed this fantastic filter exchanger. They combined physicists, robotics experts, and astronomers, and that was their delivery for the camera, their contribution. You can see now how gently the clearance is only a few millimeters at the tightest point. So you have to be very precise when you push filter through. So it all works. We had some problems with cooling system that we had to re redesign, re-implement. And this week, we are doing the final cool down of the camera in California at Slack Lab. It will take about two to three months of measurements to demonstrate that it's stable, hopefully and then we'll box it up and send it by Boeing 747 to Chile in October, and that will be then the last phase of the project where, where we need to commission it and start with LSST in about a year and a half. I added this slide, maybe it's too detailed, but because I knew you are big on machine learning, and I like machine learning, I just wanted to summarize in one slice, slide what kind of problems we will be facing with this new data set. The project will reduce the data, will find objects, will measure objects, put these numbers in database. But from that point on, it's up to user to analyze and ask scientific questions. So one way to think about our data set is that for each of these 40 billion objects, we'll measure them about 1,000 times. There will be 1,000 different images that that object is detected on. And each time we measure position, we measure how much flux we got, how many photons, the shape, various parameters, of the order 10 independent parameters. So we will end up with like 10,000 numbers per object. So you can imagine this data set as a 10,000 dimensional space, and that space is populated by 40 billion objects. So obviously you have to use computer tools, you have to use machine learning to do things. What we want to do, we already know, this is three-dimensional case of what we today do in machine learning. So all of these geometric morphologies are supposed to illustrate clumping on objects. So there are some objects that look like torus, some objects that look like, I don't know, bubblegum, used bubblegum, tooth, or whatever. You want to teach computer to recognize the existence of different clumps and you want to teach computer to quantify their morphology, the geometry of those clumps. Then you want to classify them. You want to recognize these are stars, perhaps, galaxies, quasars, asteroids, in that, that three-dimensional space of something. And often, the most interesting objects are those that behave like anything else. They are different. They are, we call them outliers in statistics, in machine learning. You want first to classify the majority of objects, and then you ask, are there any other objects that are in so rare, like Andreas tidal disruption events, that you can actually find them as special events? And so we know how to do this today, but it's low dimensionality. It's easy to do it, 100 dimensions, maybe 1,000 if it's a simple problem with not billions of objects. Once you go to many millions of maybe 100 million objects, if your algorithm is scaling with the square of the number of the objects n square, then you're dead, you can't do anything. So we must develop new algorithms that are so-called n log n, that scale essentially linearly with the data set. And this is now an active research area in the context of machine learning to be able to handle these multidimensional spaces of thousands of dimensions and billions of points. And lastly, because I know you are also interested in education and public outreach, I wanted to point out that as a part of the project from the very beginning, we had funding to develop very fancy education public outreach tools. 
So there are some links in here. I will give you a link to the whole talk at the end. So you can go there and you can find, you can find uh, bilingual materials in English and Spanish for popularization of astronomy through video clips, through web materials that speak to general public. Then you can find something more focused, materials that are meant for planetaria, museums, where you have selection of people who really want to learn about astronomy. Then we will have materials to support curricula that include astronomy in schools, where you have relatively simple, easy to understand data set, for example, by high school students. You don't have to download any software. You go to our website. All the kids go just with the browser. They can do rudimentary astrophysical analysis, like looking at objects in different filters, different colors, and then you explain to them why do objects have different colors, what does it mean when a star is red or blue as opposed to red or blue galaxy, etc., etc. And finally, we also have computer games. I showed you our scheduler when we were jumping around the sky deciding where we need to observe the next image. So that's simplified in this game, Space Surveyors. You get finite amount of time to discover as many galaxies, supernovae, asteroids, airplanes in that amount of time. And it's fun. You can try it. You just go to this place. And all these links will be, the link to the talk will be at the end. So to summarize, where are we now? So as I said, we are delayed by COVID, but we are almost there. Camera is ready to be shipped in October of this year to the summit in Chile. That will mean that everything is in the observatory in Chile on the summit, all the pieces, all the instruments. Software is already operational. So in about a year of commissioning, we are hopeful that everything will perf be performing according to requirements, and then we'll declare that we are ready to start LSST. And instead of having commissioning observations where we decide manually what to do, we take computer instructions and say, here we go, here is the observatory, run it for 10 years and call us when you're done. So that's my last slide. To summarize, this is about this new data set, 10 year worth of astronomical data that will resolve time variation of the faint sky, that will provide data for billions of objects, first time more objects than people living on Earth, 10 billion alerts and lots of other objects. And if you want to take some of these images, feel free or get the links. This is the, you can just type in ls.st, that's easy to remember, and ung, you can guess it's also easy to remember. Thank you so much for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Really impressive project. So do we have questions from the audience? Or should I start maybe? Oh, we have one. <laughs> okay. So you mentioned these 100 petabytes of data. Can you just tell me a little bit more what you, how to plan to deal with that? I mean, I, if I understand correctly, you're not going to store them on, on site in any form. You are just going to transmit them to, to the two storage. There will be a copy in Chile. Ah, you will have a copy. And then it goes to California. Uh -huh. And then again, it's forked into France and England. So immediately we'll have four copies. And then after, so every year we'll have a data release where we'll process all the data up to that point. So the raw images will always spin on disks. But data products that now become obsolete after two years will archive them on tapes and put in storage so that so you'll always have the latest. This is actually my second question. Do you, you, you don't plan to use the raw data for analysis. There is some post-production done. Correct. They are, so when you make CCD image, then there is background that you need to correct for. Each pixel has slightly different sensitivity, so we correct for this. Every night, atmosphere is slightly different, so it has different absorption. So we have to put everything on the same physical scale. 
we basically give you number of watts per meter square per second coming from that object. It's mm -hmm. all calibrated astrometrically, so the imaginary coordinate system is always the same. Mm -hmm. We warp it slightly to account for different atmospheres. Mm -hmm. So it's all done for users by the project because that's something that everyone has to do and everyone has to do it in the same way. So we get to a point in data processing where from that point on, depending on your science, you will do different things. And now we cannot do everything for everyone. So we did, or we will do, everything that is common to all science cases, which is basically correcting for instrumental effects in hardware and atmosphere, and finding objects, measuring their properties, putting in database that is easily accessible. And from that point, it's up to you, to your knowledge, to your resources, to your ideas, to your motivation to do science with. It's some way similar to particle physics, CERN. We take everything. Uh, maybe I can ask. So uh, I was very impressed with this movie, how the telescope moves, because I, that, that the first time I saw it, it really looks very quick. It's almost like animation. Uh, but my question is, uh, for after the survey will start, how many people will be there at the observatory to take care of all these technical issues? During the day, when we do regular maintenance and so on, there will be about 20 people. During the night, when we do observing, there will be just three people. And that's basically for safety, safety of equipment, safety of people. But they will not have much to do. They will basically monitoring, yeah. and the computer will just drive the whole thing. Uh, and one more question I have is the uh, Chile is known for earthquakes, so can you tell us a little bit more about the, the building, uh, any special things you had to Architects about? told us they designed the building for a 100-year earthquake, but they didn't tell us how often 100-year earthquakes happen. <laughs> <laughs> huh? Questions? question. Uh, what is the altitude of the observatory? What altitude? It's very close to 3,000 meters. Hmm. About three gloves. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> it's still low enough that you don't need oxygen masks. At about 4,000 meters, then you need, to, you need to start wearing oxygen mask. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, I'd like to express my deep, really deep admiration of this project. Thank it's you, sir. fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. I have three questions. First, will you use the adaptive optics in the mirror? Will be use the adaptive? We will use active optics, active optics. not adaptive. Okay. So adaptive is when you shoot lasers in the atmosphere to correct for the turbulence. Uh -huh. That cannot be done over such a large field of view. However, we will be using active optics, which means that we have 200 pistons below the mirror. Mm -hmm. And now, as you change the telescope in position, especially in altitude, the different force of gravity deforms the mirror. And then you need to slightly deform it back to have the perfect figure. So we have in corners four sensors that will be measuring wavefront. Then we will solve equations for the propagation, invert them, to find out what is the error in the mirror figure. And then those 200 pistons will get instructions whether to pull or push. And that will be happening about 10 times per second. That's called active optics, and that will be done. The second, are there any plans to build something like that on the northern hemisphere? There was at some point, right now there are no plans. At some point, about 10 years ago, there was a Russian oligarch who wanted to do something for Russian science, and they were committed to a few hundred million dollars to build a copy. It won't take as much as the original. And we were very hopeful it would happen. And then things were slowed down by development of their own robotic array of telescopes. And we just didn't do it in time. He disappeared. I mean, his interest in astronomy disappeared. Maybe he disappeared too, I don't know. But now, obviously, with this war, that option is out. Maybe if there was a strong case to do it in Northern Hemisphere, it wouldn't be too impossible to raise, say, $300 million to build a copy or maybe $400 million. But at this moment, 
There is relatively decent sky coverage in the north from SDSS and then from PANSTAR survey. And we know that for most of the science we want to do, it's either statistical, and we think half a sky is sufficient, or for things like asteroids, we will cover the entire ecliptic. So the science drivers for making northern copy are not as strong as they were for, for the original. It would be great to build it, but yeah. it's not obvious that we'll... The third question, because of wide angle, how you will deal with Elon Musk Starlink satellites? That's an excellent question. So <laughs> the precise answer depends on how many satellites will be ultimately launched. It also depends on brightness of the satellites. And it also depends on how our instrumentation will react to them. But probably so, it will be disturbing. Right. So there is no firm answer. But based on the best knowledge we have right now, so assuming there will be no more than about 50,000 satellites, and SpaceX and other providers say they probably don't need more than that, assuming that these satellites will not become much brighter than the generations of satellites they already launched, maybe even fainter, and assuming that that brightness will not saturate our detectors, then the net effect based on simulations is we would have to find them in our images. We already have software for that. We put mask along this track. So effectively, it's similar to gap between CCDs. So when you add up all those bad pixels that we must mask because there was damn satellite on it, it comes to about 1% of all the pixels. Thank you. So it is nuisance, requires new software, but it's not catastrophic. More questions? I was it hard to convince the Chileans to allow you to blow up the top of the mountain? <laughs> no, that was easy, because Chile is the, the most important country for astronomical observations in optical range. About, if you add up all the mirrors in telescopes on Earth, 60% of that area is in Chile. It's a big business for Chile. They even have agency for astronomy at their Ministry of Science to help foreign astronomers come. So they were super happy that there is yet another big telescope being built in Chile. Of course, we had to respect their laws. We had to do environmental studies that we will not destroy insects, little animals, and all of that. We had to work with, work with indigenous population, etc. So there was work to be done, but generally, Chile is happy that they are the capital of astronomy in the world. Excellent point. Miners are much worse than astronomers. <laughs> Okay, there are no more questions, and I will conclude with one more question from me. So what is your, uh, like say, the favorite science thing that you would like to learn from uh, LSST? Is it, uh, do I sense it right that it is in cosmology? It is dark, this dark energy puzzle? Or? I'd like to know the answer. I don't want to do it myself because it's uh, tedious work. But I'd like to know the answer to, is it more likely that something's wrong with GR? Or is it really that there is something called dark energy and we are clueless about it? From the fundamental physics, from like the big picture view aside from astronomy, I think that's the most fundamental questions for, question for physics. I also would like to know if there is killer asteroid on Im impact path. <laughs> we would but all like to know that. <laughs> personally, uh, what I want to do is something that you can do with relatively smaller group, with students, my long-term plan, after we finish the observatory, is to gradually return to Zagreb and Croatia and do maybe five, ten years worth of science from Zagreb. So I'm looking for projects that can be done locally where I don't need a team of 100 people. And that will be mostly based on stars and on Milky Way structure that I had fun when I worked on SDSS with. So that's something that you can do in a smaller institution with five or ten people as opposed to 100 or 1,000. Great, good luck. <laughs> Thank you very much. Ah, okay. No, this is more like uh, the, about the regulations with the Chilean community. I know that many observatories in Chile needs to offer the 10% uh, observation. In this case, uh, you say that this is a, there is a general, uh, um, let's say, um, 
um, optimization of the data. So how do you deal with this? Uh, I don't know if this is a rule or, or not. How, right. how, yeah. So whenever you build a new telescope in Chile, Chileans get 10% of time on that telescope. But with this telescope, it doesn't make sense because it's a survey telescope. It's one algorithmic way to observe. So we made early a deal with Chilean community where we provided certain number of millions of dollars for their students and for exchange with United States so that students can come work in the United States for a while, their PhD students. There is a data center built in Chile, in La Serena, just for the use by Chilean community. And then there are some educational exchange programs. So we basically agreed on what is equivalent of those 10% of the project. And so everybody was happy in the end. Thank you. OK, so let's thank uh, Jill. Thank again. you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs>